Yesterday, Alexander and I celebrated our three-year anniversary. It was crazy. Three years of being married, yes. Um, feels like it was just yesterday when we were engaged and ready to get married, and then there you go. Been married for three years. And as a, as a trying to be a good husband, I thought we should go to a special place for dinner. So we did. We went to a special place in San Clemente, and it was nice, but it was so special we had to get a reservation. And when we got a reservation, it was an early reservation at 5 o'clock. So I left work at like 4, 4.30 to go to dinner, and it was kind of weird. And we got there. We were like the only ones in the restaurant. That's how early we were. Uh, not for the early for the reservation, but uh, we felt like we were having an early dinner. So early that we got done at like 6 o'clock, done with dinner. And we didn't know what to do with ourselves because we had dropped Eden off. So we went and we drove around and we got ice cream and she had one bite because she's pregnant and she felt grossed out after one bite. Um, but trying to be a good husband, you know, I was trying to do the whole like anniversary thing because anniversaries are important because it's the time to like stop and celebrate somebody that you care about, right? Your, your, your husband or, or your wife. It's important. And I think you would say about me, I'm a bad husband if I don't at least do something for our anniversary to celebrate my wife. You'd probably tell me that. Um, but you'd also probably tell me that if I never ever stopped to celebrate her and to appreciate her and to tell her how great of a wife she is, if I just did that one time a year on our anniversary, you'd probably say, well, that's good that you did it on your anniversary, but that's not enough. You probably should be nicer to her more often and take her to dinner and celebrate her and tell her how great of a mom she is and how much she cares for this little baby Eden, even when she feels sick and when the baby's crying in the middle of the night, she's always the first one to go get this baby. And I, I should probably tell her that more often. That's probably what you would tell me if I said, I only celebrate her once a year. Now, I celebrate her more than once a year, but when I put it like that, you might start to make the connection that that's oftentimes what we do when we start talking about how great God is. We leave the celebration of how great God is to certain times in the year. Maybe we think about it especially at Christmas time or at Easter time, or maybe for some of us, we only think about worshiping God when we walk into church on Sunday morning. We separate out the times of celebration to little particular times, but not many of us worship him and give him the honor that's due to his name, as that song just said, regularly, often, not just when we're singing songs, but all the time. Well, we come to the last song that we're going to study in the Psalter, not the very last one, but it's the last one we're studying together, and it's all about worship. Now, a lot of these psalms are about worship, and you might have noticed we didn't even pick that many that were about worship because there's so many to choose from. We picked so many different psalms, but this one is all about what you and I do when it comes to our relationship with God. How do we think about God? What do we say to God? How do we compliment God? What are the types of things that we should say about God to other people? All of those things I just described are encompassed in the word worship. We talk about that word a lot at church, but I want to study what that word means. So please grab a Bible and look at Psalm 145. Psalm 145. This is the last Psalm in the Psalter that's from David. And this one's an interesting one because it's a it's one of the acrostic poems. That means it goes A, B, C, D. In the Hebrew alphabet, it goes down, and every verse starts with a new letter. And I think he wrote it that way because he wanted us to memorize it. I'm sure he had this one memorized. A lot of what he says here relates to his other psalms so much that surely he had this one memorized. And it'd be good for us to put some of this in our memory bank as well when we think about what it means to worship and praise God. Now, there's a lot of words for worship in the Bible, and many of them come in these first couple verses. So check out Psalm 145, verse number one. It says, I will extol you, my God and King. So he's talking to God here. He's worshiping God. What does he say first? I extol you. That means to lift him up, to say how great he is. Then he says, to bless your name forever and ever. So how does he lift God up? Well, one of the things he does is he tells God how great God is. Now, that might seem weird, but that's what you do whenever you pay anyone a compliment. If I say something nice about my wife, what I'll say is, you are so good at X, Y, and Z. You are such a loving mom. You're so good at this. You're just so great. What am I doing? That's praising somebody. That's what we do with God. Now, I gave that example because I think it's a common one. We might say nice things about other people, but the ultimate saying nice things or worship is reserved for God. We've probably heard that before, but I want that to be super clear as we're reading these verses. It says, I'll extol you. Why? Because you're my God and king. He says something about God there. He says, God, you're my leader, you're my authority, and you're my king. I want you to look up. Remember who wrote this? David. David, the king, says, 
My king is someone else. That's interesting, isn't it? It's like if the leader of the group said, well, I have a higher leader. My only leader is the Lord. He's worshiping God here. Verse two says, every day I will bless you. That's another word for worship, bless, to say something good about someone else. And this situation is about God. Another word here, and to praise your name forever and ever. Think about that. He thinks even when I'm dead, I'm gonna be worshiping God. Even in the next life, I'm gonna be worshiping God. So it's not just something for here and now. He says, I will do it forever. Now that's pretty high praise. Maybe he's just emotional, but look what he says in verse number three. He says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. So he's not worshiping somebody who doesn't deserve worship. A lot of things that people worship in this life that don't matter that much. People worship their popularity. People worship their own looks. They find celebrities and they call them their idol, right? There's a lot of ways that people worship other people. There's ways that people worship money or sports. And as maybe good as those things can be, they're not meant to be God. They're not meant to be worshiped in the way that God's meant to be worshiped. He says, the Lord's greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. Basically, if you were gonna dig a hole and find the bottom of what's the goodness or what's the, what's the bottom of God's goodness? How far could I dig into God's goodness? It says, you'll never find the bottom of his goodness. You could keep chipping away for all of your life and, and eternity and you will never, ever understand the fullness of how good God is. So he's greatly to be worshiped and praised. Verse number four says, one generation shall commend your works to another. One generation of people will look back at what God has done in the past and tell the next generation all the stuff God did back then. In order to do that, you have to know something of what God's done. That's one of the reasons we study the Bible. I know we study the Bible for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is so that you can know what God's done so that you can tell the next generation about the things that God has done. That's one of the reasons you study the Bible. Not the only one, but one of them. It says, and I shall declare your mighty acts. When you look throughout the Bible, you can think of some of the mighty acts of God, can't you? Some of the things that God did that were amazing. He flooded the world. He made the world in six literal days. Think about it. That's, that's a mighty act. That's something that doesn't happen every day. God judged the Egyptians with 10 plagues. He sent those plagues down. Why? To let his people go. He created a nation of people from just one family. He made a million people out of them in 400 years, all while they were in slavery in Egypt. That's pretty amazing. He brought them out. He took them through the wilderness, although they rebelled and were stubborn. And it felt like every generation continued to reject God with only a few people that loved him and served him with his whole heart. And by those few people, God saved the whole group and brought them in. Those are some amazing things that God has done. That's one of the reasons we study the Bible. Verse number five says, on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. I don't know if you remember that word meditate it came from the first Psalm that we ever studied. Remember Psalm one talked about meditating on God's word, that idea of thinking and chewing on it in our heads. That's what he says, I will do about the 10 plagues. <laughs> That's what I'll do about the Exodus. I'll think about it and I'll think about it again and again. And because I'm thinking about it, I'm gonna tell God how good he is and I'm also gonna tell other people how good God is. He keeps going, verse number six. It says, they shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. I'm gonna tell people how good you are. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness. Like not me, but the works are gonna do that. Like when I tell people about what God has done in the past, the works that God has done themselves will, it's like the works are gonna pour forth praise. The works themselves will praise God. That's amazing. And so sing aloud of your righteousness. Verse number eight says, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Now that right there is probably one of the most famous verses in all the Bible because that gets repeated all the time. That comes from Exodus 34, six and seven. Those of you who were in train had to memorize that. Exodus 34, six and seven talk about how God is good. That's the first thing he says about himself. I am gracious, I am merciful, I am slow to anger, and I'm abounding in steadfast love. That passage goes on to say, and I'm a righteous God who will by no means clear the guilty. If you wanna know who God is, he says it right there. Now, that's just a little bit. That's just a slice of what this psalm is gonna say. We'll get into more of it in a second. But as you start to read this worship song, I think you're gonna notice some things. First of all, I think the thing you might notice is that we should worship God for two things, for what God has done in the world, all the works that he's done, but also for who he is. Just like I would say good things about my wife, not just about what she does, but about who she is. That's part of giving that compliment or praise, or in this term with God, worship. 
That's what it looks like. But secondly, you might notice that we don't give God the worship he deserves all the time. I don't know if when you read that, you had that thought, but I certainly had that thought that when he says, I'm going to worship God forever and ever, and God's greatly to be praised, and I will bless him every day, I start to look at my own life and think, I don't know if I do that, like David does that. I don't know if I worship God as much as I should in the way I should. I think that is the first big takeaway I want you to have from this psalm of worship. Point number one, I'd love for you to write this down. I want you to confess your worship shortcomings. I want you to think about how you have fallen short when it comes to worship. I need to think about the ways that I have not worshiped God correctly, my shortcomings when it comes to worship. He says, every day, forever and ever, my mouth will praise you. At the end of the, of the whole psalm, the last verse, Psalm 145, verse 21 says, my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. Sometimes we think worship is just something that goes on in our heart. Now it starts there, but look what he's saying. I'm not just going to think big thoughts about God. I'm also going to take the next step of telling people how good God is with my mouth, like actually saying it out loud. That's, that's another step. And he says, and let all flesh, all flesh, whether it be people I know, whether it be Christians, non-Christians, everyone should bless his holy name forever and ever. That's what God deserves. Because right? I think when we think about your worship shortcomings, the reason I put it that way, and I think that way about my own life when it comes to worship is because God deserves more worship than I give him, right? When you think about your life, does God deserve more worship than you give him, more praise than you give him? I think the answer is yes. I think that goes back to what we studied at winter camp. Remember we studied thankfulness, how we said from Romans chapter one that the start of sin is when we don't thank God the way that we should. That was the start of the first sin of Adam and Eve, and that's also the start of many of our sins. We complain and we do what's wrong and we covet and like we're learning in main service, we envy. And where does that start? Well, it starts when we don't give God the worship he deserves. I'd love for you to write this verse down. Romans 1, 21. Romans 1, 21. This is one of the verses we looked at at winter camp. Here's what it says. It talks about this group of people who did not respect God. They did not serve him. It says, for although they knew God, these non-Christians, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. That's the start of the path down the path that goes away from God. I'm just going to start by not thanking God rightly. Now that might seem like not a big deal to us. It's a sin of omission. It's something we don't do that we should do, but it is a big deal because look what happens next to these people. They don't honor God the way he should, and they become futile in their thinking. So their thinking becomes wrong. They start to think that what they have in this life is owed to them. They start to think, like entitled people, that they deserve good gifts from God. Their thinking gets messed up. And then it says, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Not only do their minds get all messed up because they start thinking they deserve things they should, but now their hearts get messed up and they're angry towards God. Worship, thanksgiving, and all that does not exist at the same time as complaining and envy and all those sinful things that we say we got to avoid. So sometimes we don't think rightly about worship. I think oftentimes we don't think rightly about worship and we fall short. We don't always do what we should. The reason I say that is because the whole Bible teaches us some things about worship. I got some verses for you to write down. Romans chapter 12 verse one says that we should live our whole lives like we are being sacrificed for God. Now, that's a weird picture in the Old Testament, um, being a sacrifice. But it says we should live as living sacrifices our whole lives engaged in worship. So when we talk, our talk should be directed to the worship of God. When we think, our thinking should be directed to the worship of God. When you get up in the morning and when you read your Bible, that should be directed at the worship of God. When you do your homework late at night, that should be directed to the worship of God. Like everything we do should be for God. It says we should be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual worship. That concept of working for God also is mentioned in the New Testament. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. Colossians 3, 23, 24. Uh, says, whatever you do, whatever job you have, so for you, you're a student, you play on a sports team, maybe you're a musician, there's things you have to do in this life. Maybe your chores. Whatever you do, work heartily. Work with your whole heart. Put your whole heart into it. Don't work halfway. 
Don't say, I'm just going to get done what I can get done. And I don't care about the rest. No, work really hard with your whole heart on the things that God has given you to do as for the Lord and not for men. So like pretend like you're turning in your homework assignment for God and consider it like a, like a worship thing. Like you're going to do your work and then you're going to give it to God and you're going to say, God, I did this for you. How would you do it for God? That's what Paul's telling us to do. It says, knowing that from God, from the Lord Jesus, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Like when you go to school and like when you do your homework and like when you play the piano for 10 hours because you have to for your piano recital or whatever, like you are worshiping God if you do it with a heart that's directed to, I want to give God praise. That's what worship looks like. It's interesting how God actually makes that available. It's not just when we sing songs. It's not just when we do things here on Wednesday and on Sunday morning at church. Now, we all have worship shortcomings, but I, I mentioned a statement earlier, and it really comes from this text that we don't often give God the praise he deserves. I want you to think for a minute, what does God deserve from you? What does God deserve from you? What does God deserve from everybody when it comes to worship? Going back to that, first thing we said, um, I think my wife deserves for me to tell her she's doing a good job. Like how often? I don't know, like once a month? Like once a year? Like how often do you, well, I don't know, at, at, at least once a week, right? Maybe more than once a week, right? Maybe once a day, right? How, how much do you think I should tell her that I love her, right? How much do you think? Guys, you're like, I don't know, like once a year? Uh, girls like, what do you think? Like, you, can, you can interact. Give me a number. Like how, how often do you think I Every day, okay, that's general. Once a day, yeah, okay, once a day, check, done. I don't want to, I'll say it, once I say it, I'm done, right? Maybe more. All the time, that feels like a lot, though. I just, it seems like a high bar there, right? I should tell my wife I love her all the time. Well, I guess I, I don't do it all the time, so I'm a little convicted by that. But I would say at, at least at least once a day, probably more than that. Probably how much does she deserve? Probably more than that, right? And that's just her, right? No offense, just her. But now let's talk about God for a second. How much worship does God deserve? Right? I know this feels like I'm asking a first grade question, but like, think about it, right? How much worship does God deserve? Right? Well, it, at least once a day, or at least, you know, a few times a day, or, or all the time might be the right answer, but what does that look like? Now I want you to take that answer, whatever God should deserve in your life. Now I want you to compare it to what actually happens, right? It's like when we talk about prayer. How often should we pray? Well, all the time. But how often do you pray? Same question, right? When it comes to worshiping God and telling God how good he is, and not just telling him, but now telling other people how good he is, how often does it actually happen? Right? How many times a day? Six times a day? Four times a day? Three times a day? Once a week? Once a year? Like how often does it happen? That is the question we're really nailing down. And once you answer that question, I think you'll probably realize the same thing I realized this week. Right? It's not enough. Whatever it is, it's not enough. However I do it, it's not enough. And I'm not telling you that you're going to get to a place where, like, I worship God enough. Just like you would tell me, I probably won't get to a place where, you know, I've told my wife I love her enough and she's a great mom enough. I probably won't ever get to that place. Because every time I say it, I could say it again, and I would, it would mean the same thing. The point is, all of us need to step up our worship of God, because we all have worship shortcomings. The Psalms put it like this, Psalm 113, verse 2, says, blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. So God should be blessed by everyone. Everyone should say good things about God from this time forth and forevermore. We are included in the forevermore part. He goes on, he says, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. How often should God be worshiped? Well, from the time the sun goes up to the time the sun goes down, right? All the time is what he's trying to say. He goes on, just the Lord is high above all nations. So is this worship thing just for the Israelites? Is it just for the people who are, you know, going to the sanctuary, just the people who are giving the offerings and sacrifices in the Old Testament, not just for them. It's for all nations. God deserves it from every one of us. He says, he's seated high above all the nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? The title of this sermon 
we are going through all these questions about God and for God. The title of this sermon is, Who is Great Like You, God? Who is Great Like You, Lord? That, that title really is actually best reflected in Psalm 113, verse number 5. Who is like the Lord our God? That's a question that we should ask. That's one we should ask God and find the answer to. Who's like God? Nobody's like God. Who deserves worship like God? Nobody deserves worship like God does. He deserves more. Whatever we do is, is not enough. Now, we could talk for a long time about how we fall short, but the good news is the Bible says that we can actually tell God how great he is and worship him, and he will receive that worship as pleasing to him. There's a way for that to happen. The problem is for most of us, if we don't think about this, we start to assume that we can just go to God and tell him how great he is. We can just walk into his throne room and tell him that he's good and we can worship him and whatever we give God will be acceptable to him. Well, if you know the Bible, you know that's not true. Not just anyone can go offer God just anything. There was a time in the Old Testament when two guys went to worship God and they offered him something that was unauthorized and they were killed immediately. We read recently in the daily Bible reading that Ark of the Covenant was going and it was going, it wasn't being held the proper way and that guy named Uzzah reached out and he tried to hold up the Ark of the Covenant. What happened there? God killed him. Uh, what? Because he tried to save the ark from falling on the ground? Yeah, that's why. Because he touched it and he wasn't supposed to. So all of this talk about worship needs to come through the lens of the fact that we can't just worship God however we want to. The New Testament says that through Jesus, we can worship him rightly. Through a relationship with Jesus, the perfect son of God, the one who lived in our place and died in our place, we can worship God. And he can receive that as good. Near the end of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and let us offer to God acceptable worship, right? Having a good heart before God and offering it to him, giving him the praise that he deserves. But we should do that with a certain type of posture. We should do that with reverence and awe, right? What is reverence and awe? It's what you do when you go to the beach. You don't turn your back on the waves. Well, maybe you do and you shouldn't, right? You turn your back on the waves, the waves are going to tell you, don't turn your back on the waves, right? You have some reverence and awe because you know that thing could kill me if I'm not careful. So some of you do when you walk outside and the footballs and the frisbees are getting thrown, right? You have this reverence and awe. You're like, okay, head's on the swivel, right? I don't want to die right now. I don't want to get hit in the head with the frisbee. There's some, there's some type of awe, like I, I don't want to, I need to be on my toes here. When it comes to worshiping God, we don't just waltz into his throne room and worship him however he wants. We have to think he is a consuming fire. And that's what it says next. We need to worship God with acceptable worship, with reverence and awe in our hearts, because God is a consuming fire. That's super important. Whenever we talk about worshiping God. Look back in our passage. Look how David worships God. Let's look at verse four again. Psalm 145, four says, one generation shall say to another generation, look at God's mighty acts. Look at what God has done. Think about what he did in the Exodus. Think about what he did in the exile. Think about what he did with the judges and how Joshua brought them into the land and how God knocked over all the walls in Jericho. Have you ever heard about that? Think about that. You think about how God saves this one tiny little group of people while all these nations have fallen, 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 and God has preserved this one tiny little nation that everyone in history has hated, the Jews, the Israelites. And guess what? God has preserved them. They're, they're still around. That's crazy. It's unlikely. It's an amazing thing that God has done. It's a wondrous work. In the glorious splendor of your majesty, your wondrous works, I will meditate. I'm going to think about those. I'll speak of your mighty and awesome deeds. I will declare your greatness. All this talk about like knowing what God has done and saying what God has done. All of that depends on you and me knowing the good things that God has done. Now, I think if I asked you for a thank you list, like what are some things we can thank God for? You could list off your house and your family and maybe your health and your clothes. And, and then a lot of that, those lists would end really fast after five or six things, right? What can we thank God for today? Well, this and this and this. And it's usually the same old things every day, right? If maybe your parents do that with you, they, what should we thank God for, right? Um, your list should be super long if you know what the Bible says, because that's what the biblical authors do. When they thank God for what he's done, they're not always talking about what God did for me. A lot of what they do is talk about what God did for God. 
right? What should we worship God for? Well, the things he did for his people long before I was born, it has nothing to do with me, but it has everything to do with God. That's a lot of what we worship God for. Our list of thank yous should be super long. Point number two, I want you to keep track of all God's goodness. Now, that might seem like an impossible task, but our text gives us four things, four ways to keep track of God's goodness, four areas or subjects where God has been good. And because this is an acrostic poem, I wanted to give you, it's not an acrostic, but hopefully a memorable way of thinking about the things we should worship God for, God's goodness. Um, Verses four to seven talk about a phrase. There's a phrase in here that is in a lot of different Psalms that describe the crazy things that God has done. Like the absolutely crazy, that if I was standing there, I, my jaw would be on the floor. Like that's crazy thing. It's the phrase wondrous works. So you can write that down for the first sub point. What do we worship God for? What is his goodness? Let's keep track of God's wondrous works. It's wondrous works. All of your sub points are gonna have the same letter that they start with, just to make it memorable for you. Not an acrostic, but getting close. What is wondrous work? Well, you might have been reading the daily Bible reading today. Hopefully you were. First Chronicles 16. I don't know if you noticed what David worshiped God for in today's daily Bible reading. In First Chronicles 16, verses 8 all the way to 36, so I'm not going to read the whole passage, but in this text, when David worships God, you know what he worships God for? Uh, for picking Abraham and for making a promise to Abraham. And passing that promise from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. He praises God for the mighty acts of raising up a nation in Egypt. And taking this nation out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. With many signs and wonders. Wonders. That's the word wondrous works. Like the miraculous things that God has done. That blow everyone's mind. Turning water into blood. Sending hail. Making the land dark in Egypt. Why do we worship God for those things? Well, because David worships God for those things. There's like this respect and awe, like, look what you did, God. You did some amazing things back then. You brought them into a land um, of milk and honey, as they say, um, a good land, a land that God provided for and, and kept. He saved them from all these different oppressors through the time of the judges. He set up a king. He picked a king, David. And that king that he picked, do you remember what God said to David? He said, you're going to be my king. And then later on in his life, 2 Samuel 7, he said, your family will always be king. Your sons will always be king. And there's going to be a son in the future who comes from your line, David, that will be king forever and ever. Always king. Always ruling. That's why when you look at the wondrous works of God in the book of Psalms, it has like an ending point. Whenever they wrote it, it's like the end of the, the, the things that they can, can talk about that happen. They can talk about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the Exodus, but they can't talk about Jesus because it hadn't happened yet. But if you are to look back on the wondrous works of God, you could continue some of these Psalms and say, oh, God didn't just bring them back from exile. He preserved them and he kept them when the Romans were oppressing them. And he sent his son, Jesus, to live a perfect life in our place. And Jesus died on the cross for my sins, not just for the people that were there, not just for the people before him, but my sins. That's a wondrous work that he did, a miraculous thing. And then Jesus rose again. He defeated death so that I don't have to be afraid when people die every day. Even people my age die. I don't have to be afraid because Jesus rose again. That's a wondrous work. You could continue to add on to this, which is why I think verse 4 Psalm 145, 4 says, one generation shall commend his works to the next. It's like every generation should be keeping track of the things that God does and say, okay, God did this in the past, telling your kids, right? God did this in the past, but guess what? He also did this in my life. Now pass it on and now write your own list. What has God done for you? And you can keep adding that list of the wondrous works God has done. That's not all. Look at verse eight. That passage I was looking at before, Exodus 34, six and seven is quoted here. Psalm 145, Eight says, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he's made. That word steadfast love is the key to understanding that passage. God makes promises and he's faithful to his promises. So like every promise God makes 
God keeps his end of the bargain and more. And the love that he shows is also a promised love. It's loyal love. That's the second thing that you can worship God for. For keeping track of all God's goodness, his wondrous works first, and then his loyal love. That's what steadfast love means. God's loyal love. I read this week that this verse is the most quoted verse in the entire Bible. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. It comes up more than any other verse in the Bible. It just keeps getting quoted and quoted and quoted. We found out what that verse had to say the first time when Moses asked God a question. Moses asked God, God, can you show me your glory? I want to know what you're like. I want to see what you're like. Exodus 33 says that Moses asked God, please show me your glory. And here's how God responded. I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim before you my name. And then he says his name, the Lord. God's name, his personal name, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy to whom I'll show mercy. When God introduces himself, all the biblical authors just always want to repeat what God says about himself. And what does he say? Exodus 34, six and seven. The Lord passed before Moses and here's what God said. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. He doesn't give sinners everything they deserve and he gives people more than they deserve. Goodness, that's grace. He's slow to anger. So when we sin and God does not immediately strike us, is God being good to us? Yes. So every sinner, every person who knows God, every person who doesn't know God, has God been good to them? Well, in this way, absolutely. Because God's slow to anger. God could rightly judge every person for every evil thing immediately. God could do that because he's holy and just. But he's slow to anger. And he's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Keeping steadfast love for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Three different words for sin. If it's not clear what type of sin God forgives. All types is what he forgives for his people. But God also will by no means clear the guilty. He will visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Point is, God will pay people back for what they've done. How can that be true and God also be forgiving? How can they be true at the same time? The only solution is Jesus. The only solution is Jesus pays for our sin on our behalf. God punishes him instead of us. That is the only solution. So I think even that verse, God being gracious and merciful and who will by no means clear the guilty, that looks forward to something that needed to happen. That's what we can look back on. So what do we have to worship God for? Well, we have a lot to worship God for. His loyal love. Now, how, how has God's love been loyal? If you're in Psalm 145, turn back to the left. Psalm 136. Look at that real quick. Psalm 136. This is a funny chapter. One of the funniest in the whole Bible, I think. Not because what it says is like supposed to be a joke, but it's funny because I'm just going to read it and you're going to be like, oh, I get the joke. I understand. Psalm 136. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords Guess what? Do you know what it's going to say next? For his steadfast love endures forever. Keep reading. To him who alone does great wonders. Do you know what great wonders are? The wondrous works, the miracles, the amazing things. Who can do those? Nobody can do those except for God. What does that show about him? That his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, his steadfast love endures forever. So like, when God made the world and put the stars exactly where they are and he put the light out exactly how they are in the place that the light beams are right now in the entire universe, God did that with understanding. His steadfast love endures forever. He spread out the earth above the waters for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, you're thinking of the sun and the moon. Interesting that the sun and the moon look exactly the same size to you but they're not the same size because they're exactly in the position that they need to be and how far away they are at the exact size that they are to be exactly perfect and they look the same. Even though the sun is millions and millions of miles away and the moon is not that far, but they look the same. Why? Because God set up this universe. That's one of the things that people in your classes, there's, there's no explanation for at school or through evolutionary theory of how, how the sun and the moon can be just perfectly set up other than someone set them up perfectly. (laughs) God did. 
What does that say about God? That his steadfast love endures forever. To the sun, to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and the stars that rule over the night, his steadfast love endures forever. Look at verse 10. Look what it says, that we're talking to the one who struck down the firstborn in Egypt for his steadfast love endures forever. See, when people worship God for stuff in the Bible, it's not always for like these nice little things that, oh, God, God, you know, let me have an A on my test, right? Although that's good, right? It's also for like God doing intense things and judging his enemies. It's not just for the little nice things. It's, it's for the big things that God does. Verse 11, and he brought out Israel from out from among them, from these Egyptians, for his steadfast love endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his steadfast love endures forever. Have you thought about the fact that Israel would have been stuck at every single turn? Like there's no way for them to escape alive unless God does the miraculous. The Israelites remember that. That's how they got where they were because God's steadfast love endures forever. And he made Israel pass through the midst of it for a steadfast love endures forever. Who overthrew Pharaoh and, the, and his hosts, his army in the Red Sea for a steadfast love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings for his steadfast love endures forever and killed mighty kings for his steadfast love endures forever. And he goes on. He keeps talking, right? What is the point? God continues to show his steadfast love and the amazing thing that he's done. Now, back to point number one, what kind of worship do we give God for bringing the Israelites out of the Exodus, right? When's the last time we worship God for that? Probably not as much as we should because it seems like David does that all the time. It seems like that's a focus in the Bible for his wondrous works, for his loyal love. Back to our passage. Look at Psalm 145. Look at verse 10. Talks about his works still. Psalm 145, 10 says, all your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. That's us. We should be saying good things about God. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Was there ever a time when God was not king over everything in the universe? There was never a time where God was not king an everlasting kingdom. Will there ever be a time when God is not the God of gods and the Lord of lords? There will never be a time when that's not the case. And your dominion endures throughout all generations. Every gen We are included. God is in control still today, just as much as he ever was. It doesn't matter what bad things you see on the news. It doesn't matter what happens in this world. God is in control as much as he has ever been in control. And everything that happens here, whether it be good or evil, he allows. And his steadfast love endures forever. That's crazy. So this section, if we're starting to keep track of the good things God has done, the third thing, I'd love for you to write this down. Keep track of God's absolute authority. His absolute authority. There's nothing that God is not in control over. There's nothing that he does not see. His kingdom is an everlasting one. That's kind of like, the ultimate compliment that you could pay a kingdom, that they continue forever. There have been a lot of people that have had power in this world. You study them in history class, all the big armies and all the amazing kings and queens and how big their palaces were and how rich they were. But guess what happens to every last one of them? They live and then they die. And after they die, someone takes over. And you know what happens to every kingdom? It goes up and everything, then every kingdom goes down. Even our little, you know, kingdom here, our country has only been powerful for like a couple hundred years. It's only really been powerful for a hundred years. A hundred years is like a couple generations in the Bible, rising and falling. Our kingdom will rise and it will fall too, but God will still be king. Have you thought about that? That no matter what happens, God will continue to be king, that he's in control. That's something to worship God for. This verse, verse 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Um, that phrase is not just used here. There's a time hundreds of years later where someone said that exact same phrase and it's not someone good. It was someone who's bad, who God had to knock down. In the book of Daniel, chapter four, you might remember King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful king in the world, the one who had everything. One day stood on his balcony and he told God that he was as great as God. He said, look at this kingdom that I made. Isn't it amazing? 
He took credit. Instead of worshiping God and saying, God, you did this for me, he said, I did this for myself. Something that might seem harmless to some of us because we do it more often than we'd want to admit. Nebuchadnezzar does that. God knocked him off his high horse. He made him crazy. So he lost his mind. And for like seven years, the dude was crawling around like an animal, probably locked up by his kids thinking he's crazy. After the end of that time, after seven years had passed, Nebuchadnezzar says this. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the most high. What does blessed mean? To say good things about them. So he says, God is good after that crazy time. And I praised and I honored him who lives forever. Talking about the eternal God. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Does that sound familiar? What is Nebuchadnezzar saying? He's saying what David said. He's like, I, I've heard this psalm and he's literally repeating it back. He goes on, he says, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing compared to God. And he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? No one can go to God and say, God, you shouldn't have done that. Right? Or let me change your plan. Nobody can, literally, nobody can do that to God. God's plan is what it is. And at the same time, Nebuchadnezzar said, my reason returned to me and the glory of my kingdom and my majesty and my splendor returned to me. So he got to be king again. Interesting. And my counselors and my lords sought me and I was established in my kingdom and still more greatness was added to me. Right? So things went well for Nebuchadnezzar. Then he says, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor. Those are the words from Psalm 145. Praise, extol, and honor. Lifting high, giving glory, to the king of heaven. That's what he calls God. For all his works are right and all of his ways are just and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. That's the end of it all. That's what he says. You walk in pride, you want to oppose God, well, God's able to humble you. God's absolute authority does not just extend in Nebuchadnezzar's day, it extends right now. In fact, in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, Jesus, it says, is given the name that is above every name, and that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. That means that everyone will praise God. Specifically, everyone will praise Jesus. That means one day, get this, everyone will know that Jesus is their Lord. One day, everyone will know that. That doesn't mean everyone's going to be in a right relationship with God. It just means that everyone will know that. That's why it says, on earth, in heaven, and and under the earth, that picture of the people who who are not right with God, even they will not, even they will will know that Jesus is Lord. He is absolute authority. Well, back in our passage, Psalm 145, verse 13, the middle of verse 13 says, the Lord is faithful in all of his words and kind in all of his works. You see that in brackets there? Um, Back in our text, Psalm 145. It's in brackets because... That's one of those phrases in the Bible that we don't know if it actually belongs there. It's in some old manuscripts, but not in all of them. I think it might have been added there just because it makes sense of everything that comes next because we're about to talk about the words and works of God. Look at verse 14. It says, The Lord upholds all who are falling, and he raises up all who are bowed down. It's an interesting phrase. That God sustains people, his people, who are humble. Verse 15 says, the eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. So everybody gets food from God. Have you ever thought about that? That all the food that you ever had was from God? Like every bite. That's why we thank God for food. Right? You know that every bite that you've ever eaten was God's gift? It's like you held out your hand and God gave you something to eat. Right? That's how it works. Like you trace back your food, all your food to something, God did it. I don't care if you're vegan, I don't care if you're keto, like I don't care if you're eating chips, all of it. You got, whatever you want to pick, whether it be healthy, unhealthy, you trace it back, God, God did that. God did it. God gave the resources. God gave the ingenuity. God gave the growth if it came from a plant. He gave the life if it came from an animal. You name it, God did it. Everything. Food is interesting, right? All food comes from God. He goes on. He says not just all food, but he says, you open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. So everything that's alive sustains its life because God chooses to sustain its life. Everything. 
with every breath, every friendship, every relationship. Where did it come from? God, God's grace. Even the things that people use to sin against God, God's grace. God gives grace even to people who don't deserve it. Matthew 5 says he, he gives his reign to the just and the unjust. That's Matthew 5, 45. He gives common grace is what we call it. Good things that God gives to everyone. Some more than others, but the point is they did nothing to deserve it. They're not even Christians. They don't even know God, but God still gives them good things. Verse number 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all of his ways and kind in all of his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him in truth. Everyone, that's why the New Testament says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who asks God with sincerity to save them from their sins, everyone who trusts in Jesus, they're saved. God does that work. He's compassionate. He's kind. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears the cry, their cry, and he saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but the wicked he'll destroy. That's the thing we're always seeing in the Psalms, right? God does good to his people, but, but to the people who won't obey him, to the people who won't submit to him, to the people who will not trust in Jesus for salvation, the ones who will try to work their way up to God and earn his favor on their own, guess what happens to them? He says, well, we'll destroy them. This passage is all about how God is compassionate and caring for people. That's the last thing I want you to write down, God's compassionate care. Some things that God is good, the worshipful things, or the things we should worship him for, his wondrous works, his loyal love, his absolute authority, and his compassionate care. Hopefully you can even memorize those things because if we start to think about the good that God has done, I want you to think, how has God compassionately cared for you? How has he compassionately cared for you? Well, if you're here at church, that means that someone likely brought you here. Um, it means when you open God's word, that was God's gift to you. You know, a lot of people in this world right now do not have God's word in their language on their lap like you do. That was a gift from God. Whether you like, you know, listening to sermons or not, that, that's a gift of God. Whether you appreciate your parents or not, they are a gift from God to you. Whether you like your little siblings or not, hate to say it, but they are a gift from God to you, right? That's true. Even your older siblings, if you're a younger sibling. The things that God has given you in his compassionate care are great. If we were to make a list, it'd be longer than you think. But if you find the ultimate things that God has given you, if you're a Christian, God has sent his son to live in your place, to die in your place, to rise again. He's given you a relationship with him. That's something that you could spend your whole life trying to come up with, your whole life trying to earn, and you would never do it if he didn't give it to you. You would never make your way to God if he didn't send his son to you. This whole passage about God being high, but us being low and God coming down to meet us, it's in so many passages. One of them that we looked at this year was Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, one and two says that God speaks. He says, my throne is in heaven and the earth is just my footstool. It's where I put my feet. And what is the house that you will build for me? The place of my rest. I'm talking about the temple, like it's small compared to him. All these things my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. He says, I'm great. I'm powerful. I don't need anything. But there are people that I will come and live with. There are people that I will come to know in a relationship. It's the people who bow down in their hearts. People that come to me with a contrite spirit who repent of their sins, who ask me for forgiveness and trust me with their whole heart to the contrite, to the broken spirited people. Those are the people that God will know personally, eternally. The New Testament puts it like this, James 4, 6, 7, and 8. James says, but God gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So what should we do? Well, it says we should submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee for you. Flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That's interesting. That although you're sinful, and although you don't deserve a relationship with God, although you and I both deserve to be on God's bad side, he did something to make a way for us to know him forever. 
That's what the gospel is all about. You've heard it a million times, I assume, but if you haven't heard it, you know the gospel is that although you and I deserve to be punished by God, God did something to fix that problem. He sent his son to live on your behalf, perfect life, perfect resume, so that you could swap lives. And he came to die on your behalf so that he could take your punishment, so we could swap deaths. And he came to rise again so that he could prove to you and me that one day he will rise us all from the dead. That's the gospel. God tells us to respond to that by turning from our sin, being done living for yourself and whatever interesting thing you're into. You're not going to live for that primarily. You're going to worship God now. You're going to turn from your sin. And you're also going to trust in Jesus. You're going to ask him to save you and you're going to trust with your whole heart that he'll forgive you. That's what God calls us to respond to the gospel. And then for the rest of your life, whatever you do, whether you become a dad or a mom, or you get married, or you don't, or you, you, you work a job, or you go to college, or you don't. It doesn't really matter. Seriously, it doesn't actually matter. What matters is that you know God, and you're a follower of Jesus. That's it. That's, that's what it's all about. That's what your life is all about. No, not to get too big picture for you, but that's all of what this life is about. If you don't get that part right, it doesn't matter how great your life is. You have to have that first part right. If you get that first part right, you'll start to understand what this psalm is talking about with worship. You'll start to feel, as you read this text, wow, I have so much to worship God for. It won't feel like a task, like a to-do list. Okay, I gotta do another thing, gotta do another thing. It's like, no, no, this is just the response that God's people have to what God has done for us. When you see God's wondrous works in the Bible and his loyal love to people in the past and to you, when you see God's absolute authority over the world and over your life, and then when you see God's compassionate care for God's people in the past and then see it in your life, worship is just what we do. It's just how we respond to God. You can never worship God enough. One of my favorite worship songs is an old song. I read a little bit about it today. It's called The Love of God. Um, and the last verse of this psalm, or not psalm, this hymn, um, written not that long ago, actually, um, this guy found in a poem book from a guy who wrote it like a thousand years earlier. So he just takes it and rips it off. But it's the last verse of this hymn. It says this, Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stock on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. That means is if you were to write out every good thing that God has done, you would empty the ocean if it was ink. The sky, no matter how big, you, you could not write small enough to cover all the good things that God has done. So if this sermon does anything for you, what I want it to do for you is to say, I don't worship God enough. I don't worship God as much as I should. I need, I need to worship him for his goodness. Once you do that, once you start to see that, you start to recognize there's a never-ending supply of things to worship God for. Tonight, I know we did musical worship and that special, um, but whether we do musical worship or not, whether you're at church or not, whether you're at school or whether you're at home or wherever you are, I want you to be a worshipful person. From all that you've learned this year, as this is the last sermon before the change of the new year, and we'll move on to our next thing. Seventh graders, you'll be eighth graders. Eighth graders, you'll be in high school. I want you to get this, that you need to worship God because God made you and he deserves your worship. He deserves my worship. So we're going to pray right now and we're going to sing one more song to him. Let's pray. God, help us not just understand this, but help us apply this. Pray for us as we do our day-to-day -day lives and we think about going to school and tasks and finals and chores and all just the, the normal life stuff that we have. I pray that throughout all of it, we'd be worshipful, that we'd take note of the things that you've done. We'd think about your wondrous works that we'd see your steadfast love, your loyal love for us, and we'd appreciate your care for us. I pray that in all that, we wouldn't feel like we're just doing a bunch of tasks for you, although that's important. We should worship you and through work, but I just pray that this act of worship, as we do it right now and as we continue to do it throughout the week, would be something that just ends up happening naturally when we start thinking about what you've done for us. We recognize that you're holy, you're our creator, you're designer and maker, and 
You're our authority. I pray that our lives would reflect that truth, that not just right now with our words, but our whole lives would. But I pray right now as we sing that our hearts would be focused on you. We pray that our hearts would be right before you as well. We wouldn't keep any sin between us and you, but we would come to you with pure hearts and clean hands, please. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.